name is Alek Tarkowski. I lead uh, the Centrum Cyfrowe Foundation here in Warsaw, Poland, uh, speaking to you today from my home as we are uh, currently following uh, maybe not lockdown, but uh, isolation procedures and are all working remotely. I'm very happy to see you here at this forum. I've just mentioned uh, where I'm working from because we did an effort to adjust the forum, an event that was very in-person that benefited from the fact that people can meet together to a situation where the big benefit is that you can join us from anywhere in the world. But some of you join us at very strange hours, uh, non-normal working hours, and we appreciate that a lot. Um, and uh, of course, uh, as Karina said, we all are joining this in a, a difficult time. Some housekeeping, as Karina mentioned, this session is recorded. Apologies for the technical difficulties. If you want to um, chat with everyone, please be mindful that the, the default setting is panelists. So we need to switch to panelists and attendees. Uh, we encourage you to chat. We're very happy to have this side channel and this is also the best place to start asking questions and making comments and we'll be following them i will be in particular as the moderator and uh, we'll have two options we can either simply read the comments uh, and the panelists will respond but we also have the op option to let people speak so if you would like to speak please mention this in chat and we'll have time in the second part to let also other people in this call comment. I'm very, very happy. Uh, there are so many of us here, almost 100 people are participating, which is a fabulous result. Um, so just a bit about this session. This is a session that um, is uh, connected with the project called Copyright for Education, which is organized by Comunia and which is collectively managed by Teresa Nobre, Maya Bogotai, and me. Um, and we, it's a project where, as the title says, we're exploring how copyright affects education, in particular copyright law. So it's a project that emerged out of our work around the European Copyright Directive, where we felt there's a need for a specific project that says that copyright connects with right to education in many ways, some good, some bad, and we need to put focus on this. We need to be speaking about the role of copyright in education to stakeholders in the copyright dialogue and to the educational stakeholders. The latter are often not involved in these conversations and we really want to have them on board. And this is the reason why uh, choosing very carefully topics for this year forum, which has limited time, because that's another thing we learned online you do things quickly, right? We're not proposing you a three-day event the way we would normally do it. Um, so we felt it nevertheless deserves our attention because we always felt that this is sort of a, a very important aspect of um, uh, or connected topic with open education. The tools are a bit different here. We talk a lot about exceptions and limitations and not, for instance, about open licensing and open practices but the goals, the principles are the same. So we are very happy that you are with us. I should mention that the Copyright for Education project is focused on Europe. Again, we sort of from the experience of the copyright directive, but we very much feel this is obviously an international issue. Teresa is uh, connecting our work with international work by being involved in WIPO level activities. Uh, so it was natural for us to invite speakers um, who will also present a more global perspective. And we hope this conversation will be also international in the later part of the session. So we will start with the uh, three talks and I would like to now uh, introduce um, uh, our uh, uh, panelists. Uh, first uh, speaking and sort of setting the stage will be Teresa Noble, who uh, is a part of our Comunia team of the Comunia Association and also connected with Creative Commons. Uh, Portugal. Uh, then Alan Roja de Souza uh, will, from Brazil, uh, will present a perspective um, on uh, from, from Latin America, from South America. It's also an academic perspective. Alan is a professor uh, and heavily involved in the work of Brazilian universities in this time of the crisis. So we're very interested in this perspective. Um, and finally, we have with us Meredith Jacob from the PG Project and Creative Commons US. Uh, United States has this very interesting advantage of having a fair use uh, system, which we're very interested to learn uh, how it works at this time of the crisis. So we'll now have these three talks and then we'll have time for discussion. And once again, uh, please feel free to comment, discuss 
in chat uh, during the talks. It's me now, right? Can I start? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Please do. So let me just share my um, my screen, and I wish I could share. Just give me a second. So are you are you seeing my presentation? Yes. Okay. And if I do like this, you keep seeing it, right? We yes, do, can. yes. Okay, perfect. So I'll start, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll present um, first the, the, the EU perspective. Um, and, and it's quite interesting that um, uh, being uh, in the global north, um, we uh, are not prepared to see that we are not yet prepared to to approach uh, uh, education uh, during um, uh, a pandemic uh, or during a, lo a lockdown that uh, that prevents schools to be open and, and requires teachers uh, to conduct teaching activities remotely. So, as 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 Alec mentioned, you know that, uh, and as many of you probably know, there's been a, 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 we, a, there was a, a huge discussion around. Uh, um, around the new education exception that covers the entire um, territory of the European Union. And that exception was approved uh, uh, through a new copyright directive that will come into effect uh, in June, 2021. So um, right now we don't yet have that approach that we'll have uh, from June, hopefully in all the European Union countries from June 21, uh, 2021 onwards. So um, as we are right now, we are still relying on uh, what member states have in their laws um, uh, before this, uh, this new copyright directive uh, comes into effect. And uh, where we are right now, it's still a, a very fragmented um, landscape uh, in the sense that uh, different European Union countries have different laws and different approaches to um, education and copyright. And specifically, uh, they have different education exceptions. Um, and I want to start uh, by presenting uh, the obstacles that we currently have to remote teaching in the European Union. And afterwards, I will tell you what's gonna be uh, precisely the solution uh, that will come from this new directive. So right now, one of the, the principal obstacles that we have uh, in Europe uh, is that the laws offer different solutions depending on the types of activities. And here I'll put a slash and say on the means of conducting, the means of communication to conducting certain types of activities. So um, the educational uses that are covered by, by, by the copyright laws vary quite a lot and they vary within a single country depending on whether you are face-to-face uh, -face or um, online. So let's see, face-to-face -face, uh, teaching normally centered around one type, one main category of activities which in in legalese, copyright legalese, we call performance, public performance, and it might have different names in different countries, but let's just, uh, for the sake of, um, of uh, not getting too complicated in terms of legalese, call it performance. So performance is everything you do in class from showing an image on a PowerPoint presentation, to showing a DVD, to reading from a textbook, playing a music piece, enacting a theater play, reciting a poem, this is all considered to be a performance. Um, and of course, when you also share materials with students in class, so paper copies, uh, uh, physical copies of materials, you also engage in something that's called distribution. So this is uh, when, when we are in the face-to-face -face education and, and performing this kind of acts, Normally, we are covered in the European Union, not necessarily uh, elsewhere, 
in the world, and we will see, we'll talk a bit about that. But in the European Union, the European Union normally these sort of activities are covered um, and are covered in two different ways, and I will explain it uh, in a minute. But let's see the differences when we go and we want to perform these activities uh, in an online setting. So when we go online, all of, all of those showing, reading, reciting, playing, enacting, um, and also all of those sharing of materials, which, which will now happen uh, through email, through a shared cloud, on the chat of a video platform, or even on a private Facebook group, or as I learn in, in South America is happening through WhatsApp. So um, uh, there's the teachers, uh, teachers and students in many developing countries uh, rely on their mobiles. So they are using mobile apps such as uh, those instant messaging apps uh, um, to share materials and to conduct online activities, online education activities. So all of this now stops being a performance and uh, a distribution of materials to become something else from a legal perspective, from a copyright perspective. So we now are talking about a communication, uh, an act of communication and not anymore of an act of performance or distribution. So everything becomes an act of communication, uh, eventually communication to the public. But let's check what are the differences between a communication and a communication to the public. So the, 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 main, the main difference from a copyright perspective, from coming uh, uh, from a face-to-face -face, uh, or from an, uh, um, being on the same uh, a classroom on the same venue uh, facing your students and going to a distance uh, 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 learning setting is that um, for one public performance is one act that is not harmonized at EU level. So the EU laws don't say what countries should and should not do with regards to public performance. And that means that countries have very different uh, laws and interpretations of what a public performance is. Um, namely, they have different interpretations of what is a public, what is a public act, and what is a public in terms of uh, am, I, am I doing something in front of a public? Um, and, and several countries say that a group of study students does not constitute a public. Uh, and therefore, a performance in a classroom is simply out of copyright. You don't even need an exception because it's simply not protected by copyright. So a lot of these things that we do in classes, reciting, showing and playing and enacting, all of this is out of copyright um, in some countries. So other countries don't have that uh, exclusion out of the, the scope of copyright to, to take this uh, acts out of the scope of copyright, but they do have exceptions. So it's it's considered to be a public performance that is a, a, an exclusive, uh, or an act that is protected by an exclusive right uh, that is owned by, by the authors or, or the right holders uh, of, of the copyright materials. Uh, but we have exceptions that cover these acts. So it's protected, but there is an exception for educational uses. And there's a few, I mean, I think I saw like one or two cases probably uh, uh, in Europe, not, not exactly sure if in Europe we still have uh, actually that, but I saw in other countries across the world situations where uh, indeed even a public performance is protected by copyright, there is no exception, and therefore in those kind of things that we consider to be uh, um, regular and normal in a class um, are not actually exempted, but no one really enforces. So it's considered to be uh, a small non-authorized user and, and therefore doesn't constitute an, an actionable infringement, or it might constitute an actionable infringement, but no one enforces it. So that's the situation in the classroom, okay? Now, when we go to online and where we are right now, where we have like this 
either we have everyone still having the remote teaching classes or we have hybrid systems depending on the country where students are some of them are going to classes uh, in, in schools and others are still taking lessons online and and therefore we need to think about the communication to the public uh, right the problem here is well first this is a right that is harmonized at EU level, so countries cannot decide what this means. Uh, what does this right mean? Uh, this is decided by the European, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union. And the Court of Justice of the European Union, of course, you need cases for the Court of Justice to, uh, to interpret what this, what this case means, what this uh, right means. And the Court of Justice has been giving a lot of different interpretations, uh, maybe not different, but well, it's not super easy to follow uh, 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 the interpretation so far. And there has never been a case with students and, and uh, in a remote teaching environment or uh, uh, even you know, an email uh, or a platform that even before the COVID, we're already using this internet and platforms to share the Moodles, et cetera, to share materials with the students. None of that has ever been uh, subject to a case decided by the Court of Justice. But we do have uh, several cases that indicate that the Court of Justice considered that the public is an indeterminable number of potential viewers. So a large number of potential viewers that we cannot determine. And when we think about the classroom, uh, a remote teaching uh, activity, uh, an online class on Zoom, we know who are the viewers, right? We have a determined group, a private group of students and their students. Of course, uh, then we can ask if the communications with the students that are happening, all of this reciting and, and uh, online and, and, and sharing materials online and sharing materials to chats and, and shared clouds uh, is a communication to the public. But of course, as I said, this is an open question and we cannot rely as simply as we can rely in, in the case of the public performance on the, on the idea uh, that maybe a communication online uh, in an online setting with students, uh, a determined number of students is out of copyright. So we cannot rely on that. We still, unless we have a decision by the court, we still have to assume that this is something that is prevented by copyright and therefore we need exceptions. So it's in copyright, it's protected by copyright and we need exceptions. And those exceptions do not exist um, in every EU country, not every EU country as an exception that allows you to make those kind of activities of communication to the public. Besides that, we have other types of obstacles. So uh, currently the laws that we have in Europe uh, and elsewhere, of course, too, uh, some of them discriminate against the entity running the activity. So you might cover educational establishments, but not cover libraries or museums. Uh, and this, this, this type of establishments also run activities. I, I, I remember reading a lot during the, 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 the first um, lockdowns that libraries were conducting the reading times online. Um, and this being an educational activity, you would need to be covered by uh, and being a communication to the public activity, you would need a, an exception for this. And the education exceptions, most of them would not cover uh, the, uh, the establishments, uh, um, the museums and the libraries, and only education, formal educational establishments. And the other problem currently that we have is that um, some exceptions say that only the teachers and the, the, uh, and, and the students and the pupils can have access to the materials when you are sharing them through uh, a secure uh, electronic environment. And that means that uh, parents would be excluded from the scope of the teaching exception. And we know that nowadays uh, uh, in, the, in the context of remote teaching, parents do need to support their, um, their kids uh, when having uh, remote um, uh, activities. So these people would be excluded from the exceptions and that's also an obstacle. The other obstacle is that some exceptions 
that we have for education clearly say that this is limited to the venues of the school. So it needs to be in the classroom. Uh, and others, you know, allow you to be out of the classroom, but they are not technological neutral, uh, technology neutral. They, they, uh, they uh, indicate technologies that you need to use and that might exclude uh, things that we are now uh, learning to use or uh, um, making use of such as social media and instant messaging apps and etc. cetera. Um, the other problem, and that's kind of a, a, a maybe a bigger problem for higher, higher university, higher education institutes, uh, institutions like universities, is that exceptions are territorial. So the uses that take place across borders are not covered. This means that a university that's running a program uh, and because of COVID, the teacher, the students are attending that program from their own locations, from their own countries and are not moving to the country where the educational establishment are located, they, of course, will face these obstacles of having to deal with the different educational exceptions, the exceptions that might or might not exist in their different countries. So that's our current situation. And in this current situation... Vanessa, three minutes, yes? okay. Okay. In this current situation, what we are doing is we are relying, basically, on lack of enforcement, so I think no one wants to talk in the EU uh, uh, about COP, except I, I've, uh, the UK, because they have a fair dealing exception. They have had a lot of discussions during COVID about uh, copyright in education, but elsewhere, everyone is simply silent because no one wants to say what teachers cannot do because of lack of uh, copyright exceptions for education. So basically everyone is kind of relying on, on not the, the, the rights of authors not being enforced by the authors. And then uh, other solutions might come from relying on fundamental rights as a limit to copyright. And uh, we at Comunia uh, draft a paper to say, uh, to, to say that if a country doesn't have proper education exceptions in place, they can rely on, uh, on, on their standards of protection of fundamental rights, namely the rights uh, to, to access to education and uh, access to information, um, to conduct activities online that are similar or equivalent to those that they could conduct uh, offline. So we have an entire paper, you can read about it. I will not discuss it, it's very legalese, uh, but we are putting forward and, and advocating uh, for the possibility to rely on fundamental rights. And finally, something that's a bit much more gives you much more legal certainty. Uh, the 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 other solution, which we have seen in one country in Europe, which is Hungary, is to adopt an emergency law, an emergency law that provides for an emergency education exception. So what Hungary did was basically, this Hungary was one of those countries that were covering public performances, distribution, but not communication to the public. And what they did, they they went with a law and they simply did something very easy, which was every exception that they have for educational activities, they added the right of communication to the public to their existing exceptions. And therefore, you could conduct online activities thanks to that simply adding of the communication to the public right to the existing exceptions. In the meantime, uh, uh, Hungary understood that uh, this should not be just an emergency law and they already made it permanent. But this is where we are. Next year, we'll be in a much better place because we have a new copyright directive that says that is mandatory for member states to have an educational accession in place that covers digital uses. So member states may, that already have such educational exceptions in place, may keep it and keep those exceptions. Those that do not have, they have to provide for new exceptions that will cover the communication to the public right. And another interesting thing of the directive it is, is that it creates a legal fiction for cross-border uses. And this is my last slide. So this under this legal fiction, uh, uses that take place under the responsibility of an educational establishment via a secured electronic environment accessible only by the establishment's students and teaching staff 
those uses that take place under those conditions by those people under the responsibility of an educational establishment are deemed to occur solely in the member state where the educational establishment is located. And this is great for distance learning programs where when we have one educational establishment and teachers and students located in different countries, you don't have to look at the different laws anymore. You just have to look at the laws of the country where the educational establishment is located. This is not great for situations where you have different educational establishments. So we have in Europe joint programs run by different educational establishments, different universities located in different countries. And this legal fiction is really not ready to cover those situations. Um, but of course, it's better than nothing. And we are very happy that we have it, uh, that we'll have it in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. So I think this is indeed interesting that this uh, sort of a unique period of conversation about the shape of copyright law as it affects education happens at the moment where suddenly there's this uh, pandemic and a complete upheaval and you showed very well how you know we are in the process of uh, so to say avoiding some conversations sorry I had my camera off um, creating legal fictions or thinking about emergency measures and I think the big question will be you know what happens when the probably the state continues and how we'll need to look for other solutions and how that will affect the implementation debate. Uh, but now I want to switch, uh, as I said, to zoom out of Europe. Let's for now treat Europe just as one space in the world where this conversation happens. Uh, and the uh, perspective I, I would like to introduce now is one uh, from a different continent. And Alan, please uh, tell us how, how the situation with copyright and education looks like in, in Brazil and South America. Well, first of all, uh, thanks, Teresa, for the presentation. Very, very clear. It made it like very clear. It will make it mine easier because I'm actually going to take some of the tips that you gave uh, to show us. Well, one major difference that we have uh, between Brazil and other Latin American countries and Europe is, uh, first of all, access to the technology in order to have online classes. Well, in common, we have we all had to move online for classes from like kindergarten to uh, higher education and, and more. Uh, but we do have a huge, um, less than many countries in Latin America, in South America specifically, but we still have a huge gap uh, in terms of access to technology. So on um, the process that started in Brazil early this century, sort of to include, digitally include more people and students and teachers really has not uh, has actually stopped during this decade so it came to a stop like at the end of around 2010 and so and then therefore we have this extra problem extra situation of having access not only to material but actually having access to notebooks to um good internet connection in order to have classes plus the other uh, economic situations um, of the country, which is plagued by inequality, like in the highest level, uh, to the level that most Europeans cannot even imagine. Um, so that also all, uh, expresses itself in the education field. So when it moved uh, online, that also became very clear. Uh, particularly, I'm talking from a position from the uh, um, college and university education, because that's where I teach, that's where I do my research and so on. So my in-hands experience is much more related to those fields. And um, But I've been working and I actually was, um, there was a high demand from all the teachers from all different grounds in terms of copyright. And this is the major change, like the first major change that we felt uh, in Brazil was a high demand for knowledge on copyright. Uh, copyright was always there, but in the face-to-face -face, uh, education, um, that basically went on without a major issue. So there was not really a problem. You basically did whatever you needed to do to get the material to the students, and the students would study however they could get their hands on the material and so on. When we talk about until the fundamental education until let's say ninth grade 
uh, the country as a whole, like the federal um, government, does pay for regular books. So like the material is actually paid for by the government in public schools all over the country. So the access to the basic material, uh, all these students will have it and we ha will have it without pay. But those material also, all that material, although bought by the government, does not have an open license. You know, it has now in the last couple of years has the option of having an open license, which has not really come through all the time. So this is the basic scenario that we had when we started the pandemic, which in Brazil really started in March, which is the beginning of our academic year anyway. So uh, that's when we start feeling, which was this March. And then we had, uh, so the first thing is a high demand for what can I do with material that's protected by copyright. So a widespread awareness of all. Copyright is an issue in education and we will need to face it. So this is the major wake up call for copyright and education in Brazil. Uh, and what we had so far until February, what was the legal scenario in Brazil? Uh, the legislation is awful in terms of limitations and exceptions. So it has very few in terms of education, really has one, uh, one exception. And if we read it strictly, which the court doesn't, and I'll be talking about this very quickly, uh, we would only be able to do music performance in class and theater representation in class. That's it. We could not like make copies for the students or anything else. There are not even a library exception um, formally into the law. So the legislation is really bad, but that has not stopped people from doing all different practices that are needed for education. Uh, most of, mostly because of the lack of enforcement, but uh, this lack of enforcement has also a reason. It's not only lack of means for enforcement or lack of desire of enforcement, it's basically because education, every time that has had a case that is related to education, in the higher courts, in the Supreme Court or the Superior Court of Justice, which are the two major highest courts, education has been uh, privileged over copyright uh, in all serious cases that have gone up. So, and that's a that's a good thing. So that's one of the reasons why there hasn't been really cases, a lot of cases before that haven't been brought against universities and teachers or students. Well, that's one thing. Well, the second thing is on the case laws. Although the um, legislation, the limitation and exceptions are very strict. Uh, we do have not one case law, two case law. We have a series in this decade, like start 2011, that's when the Superior Court of Justice start facing for the first time how uh, the limitations and exceptions must be interpreted. Although Brazil is a civil law country, uh, the decisions have been consistent and means like unanimous uh, that the interpretation must be extensive. That is, uh, we have the right to use material without pre-authorization and without remuneration, not only in those stated cases in the law, but also in other situations whereby uh, all the fundamental rights show themselves to be uh, stronger or um, more valuable than copyright in those circumstances. And the court made an explicit point of saying that limitations and exceptions are rights. They are representations of fundamental, of constitutional fundamental rights. Uh, therefore, uh, the interpretation and application of the legislation must consider uh, the impact of copyright protection on other fundamental rights and make the proper balance on, on regarding it on each case. Uh, and we do have a few directions on it, uh, and I'll tap on it like a little later. So this was the scenario we had, and that went through, that was consolidated uh, in the legislation, in the interpretation of the legislation throughout the decade. And last year, in June last year, in 19, 19, 2019, uh, we had a decision from the Council of Federal Justice where it's not a law, but it's a soft I would say it, it has the role of a soft law with an, uh, an statement of how certain things must be interpreted by all judges. 
and that comes from the highest level of judge. So that really influences the lower level judge and it says specifically limitations and exceptions on copyright must be interpreted extensively. That is, those are just examples of uses that you can do, that you can make them because they reflect um, both a balance between fundamental rights and also the social function of all properties which social function of property in the Brazilian system means, and that's a constitutional uh, limitation on, on all properties, means that um, the proprietor, the owner, not only have rights, but it has duties towards society and toward other people because of other fundamental rights. So that's basically um, the, uh, the core result. So COVID came, all classes went online, the legislation doesn't um the legislation doesn't say anything doesn't help at all doesn't have anything on online education at all uh even the face-to-face -face education has very simple and then um with that came the consciousness of copyright impediments or possible impediments the unclear how unclear the field of what you can do legally and what you can't do legally is and also the lack of guidelines not only from legislators um but in a way also from the court besides this general guideline that can be applied by all institutions and should be applied but also the lack of institutional regulations not only on co what kind of uses you can do in this university for example but also the lack of policies on open education resources the lack of open access uh just access to scientific material policies so basically the lack of regulations instructions guidelines policies institutional policies that became really apparent so that is maybe uh this is the first not the first but the major result of covid on education in brazil and what followed up from there was a demand an urgent demand to regulate it so uh and regulate it in a very positive way for education considering the courts have already in a lot of ways sided with education in a lot of in the few cases that reach the highest courts which we can't count more than 10. Uh, so, uh, and when it came this urgency in this last two months, there has been a rush in the country, like in the state departments, like, I mean, the, you have the national, you have the, well, the country as a whole, and then you have the states and you have the city ones. So in the terms of the cities, the states, and also the universities, they're all self-regulating what they can do in terms of copyright, taking, departing from the fundamental rights <clears throat> argument and from the court decisions. So they're basically structuring what one can do in terms of copyright, basing on their practices. And now, so far, we have two universities, uh, major universities, federal universities, that have regulated it for the the emergency period and within that regulation uh, there is uh, a quite uh, substantial openness to share material with students to make material available to students uh, <clears throat> to report the classes and the conditions they are going to be make available also uh, for the adaptation of material for people with disabilities uh, so all those issues seem to have come together in the self-regulations that have been happening at university levels, but also at city levels, they will take care of what the teachers at their schools can do. And to just give an example, like very young children's uh, teachers were asking, like, can I read um, the book online and record me reading the book to the students, which are five, six, seven years old? and don't really <clears throat> read that well. <clears throat> that's not something that's in the law and that's being allowed by the guidelines that were given by um, cities and states and so on. So coming to an end and looking at the future, what are we gonna take from this? Um, what I see happening, and I know there are five other top universities trying to 
working on the regulation of it, we're going to start seeing a lot of uh, institutional policies, not only regulating copyright use and copyright, what we can do, what teachers can do, what students can do, what libraries can do, what researchers can do within uh, the institution. So the institutions will take the responsibility for these guidelines. And if there is any uh, legal questions that you're going to have to do facing the universities. And most of the major universities in Brazil are public. They are federal universities. So they're basically picking up a fight with the federal government in general. Uh, so this is happening. We have two already in place, and I know there are five others um, on the way, all very well and flexible. I haven't been able to translate them because the, well, the last ones just came out like last Thursday. So it's really on the go at this moment. Um, the second thing is this has sparked a copyright debate that goes has revived the copyright debate that what was happening before was very pro industry was very pretty much talking about intermediary liabilities isp payment for whatever author rights or news corporations and every all the other issues but very few conversation about limitations and exceptions but that, now that is on the table um the federal government will regulate will do some sort of regulation for the online teaching um there was a decree that just came out just establishing a commission to do so and that will have to come out this year for the next year academic year uh and copyright and education came on the table also open education resources came on as like a very urgent thing to do so I expect in the next few months we're going to see <coughs> quite a few moves <coughs> within the brazilian scenario and I do know in other countries too, the open uh, educational resource have come up, other countries in Latin America, have come up as substantial for the fact that we do have some of the institutions have their policies. Some countries have very minimal uh, guidelines on that, but I do see as not only a fertile moment for moving that ahead, but also an, a demand, an an urgent demand from teachers, students, institutions, and government. So I see it's it's coming up to a situation, circumstances where uh, we may have a favorable scenario for moving forward, forward with open education resources, as well as limitations for uh, education. Uh, and finally, um, one thing that uh, we are seeing is a strong push from European Union uh, for the importation of EU copyright directive. However, what's actually getting there are only the bad parts of the European directive. Everything that's being is about like uh, creating new rights to remunerate news agency. Uh, expanding uh, the enforcement, restricting the limitations, and we haven't so far seen the export of the new possibilities that came with the EU directive, which is not all bad. It has some, some very good points on it. So um, this is the scenario. And I see that the same thing that Europe did with um, the GPDR, which I think was a good thing, exporting the legal model to the world, it's now doing the same with uh, the copyright directive. And so I foresee the next year, for example, we will have a lot of debates uh, around uh, what should and what could be implemented from the European Union in Brazil and other Latin American countries. That actually was part of the EU Mercosur uh, treaty, uh, as far as I know. So, um, what just to finalize uh right now people teachers students and institutions and the governments all levels are pretty much aware for the first time of how copyright impact education uh not always in a good way i'll say most of the time not in a good way <laughs> in that case and how much we lack institutional policies federal guidelines in open educational resource access open access in general and, and so on 
Uh, and I see like that the moment comes for a big push in terms specifically on education, freeing education from copyright. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alan, for this uh, overview of the situation. And I, I like the way where you sort of demonstrate both a dynamic in the copyright law debate and a dynamic in the education sector caused cause the, by the pandemic, which, which I think is exactly the purpose of our conversation. Um, I wanted to point out that there are quite a lot of comments appearing in chat. I think we might not have time to answer all of them, so you can start looking at them, picking the ones you want to address, but maybe there's also something you can quickly reply to on chat. I'm, I'm speaking to Teresa and Alan, and I would like now to give the voice to Meredith. Good morning. Um, thank you for having me. And I wanted to echo Alex's earlier statement that, you know, if there is a silver lining to this transition to doing this event online, it's that we have such a large group. I think 110 attendees might be the largest ever. So that's a, a cheering thing to see people together. Mm -hmm. um, when we were talking about the planning for this panel, uh, one of the notes that was written that was that I was going to talk about how uh, fair use enabled a smooth transition to online teaching. And having worked with teachers and professors and librarians and others over the last six months, I think I would be getting a lot of hate mail if I described the transition to online teaching as a smooth transition, because I think it was uh, pretty frantic and a lot of work. But I think that it is true that fair use from a legal perspective does enable um, a lot more sort of flexible and responsive pivot in situations that are unforeseen by the law. One of the things that I think is um, a really durable benefit of fair use across um, areas of practice, whether it's new technologies or new situations, is that um, these general open and flexible limitations and exceptions like fair use that don't limit who can use them and don't limit the um, eligible uses can in fact be more responsive in an emergency like this pandemic um, and this transition to online teaching. So uh, like Alan, uh, one of the earliest questions that we heard was, can I read this book out loud? So we were getting questions from kindergarten teachers and others who were having this unplanned emergency transition to online teaching and wanted to know if they could read books to students to try to create that classroom feel. And um, as we got into the work, we realized there were sort of two different uh, categories of questions that we were talking about. Questions that were really about the short-term continuity of teaching, which were, you know, can I read this book out loud? Can I scan these chapters of physical textbooks where we had a set of textbooks for the classroom, but students didn't have them to take home? Or in the higher education situation, where uh, students were relying on getting to use textbooks and other materials that were on reserve at the library physically, where they would go in and use them for a couple hours and those weren't available. So we had this set of questions about these continuity of teaching examples. And then we had a different set of questions which were really more broadly uh, questions about enabling remote teaching. So, you know, when can I use materials in my online teaching going forward generally? And one of the things that we found was that um, with a few exceptions, most of what fair use enabled during the emergency transition, it also would enable going forward in online teaching and learning. That we didn't find this sort of stark delineation of stuff that could be done during the emergency, but couldn't be done going forward. There are some exceptions, I think primarily around um, scanning and distribution of sections of textbooks to meet um, that need during the emergency. One of the things that happened, given the timing in the United States of the pandemic uh, really peaking, well, beginning to peak in March, was that many students in higher education went home for spring break, so a traditional school holiday for about a week or two in March, and left their textbooks at school, and then were told not to come back. So um, in those situations, uh, fair use could enable scanning textbooks and distributing them to students when online versions weren't available. And that probably isn't 
available going forward when you have a more planned switch to online teaching. But most of the other questions that we dealt with, like for example, whether an uh, elementary teacher could read a book um, over Zoom or over YouTube and um, distribute that to her students or his students, those things were something that would be enabled both in the emergency and also going forward by fair use. Some of the questions that we saw that um, ultimately ended up not being uh, dispositive to the legal outcome were questions about, um, you know, do I need to do this only in a platform with uh, digital rights management? Do I need to do this only in a situation where I have access controls or copying controls? And as we examine those, I think one of the things that um, was mentioned by Alon, but is very important here is that fair use is perhaps at its um, most operative when you're dealing with an intersection of two spaces, which is access for students with disabilities and um, access these sort of educational uses more broadly. And so in all of the work that we did, we thought it was very important to emphasize that while limiting access to a platform where you are signed in or linking out to specific content might allow people to have to not, not have to dig into questions about fair use, that it posed this real risk of disadvantaging students with disabilities for whom linked content might not be accessible or disadvantaging students who had limited broadband or who are using borrowed devices. You know, one of the things we saw in this transition was that many students did not have a computer or a tablet that was assigned to them by their school. And so we're using shared or borrowed devices at home. And so um, complicated sign-in systems and DRM systems could pose a barrier to access for those students. And more specifically could disproportionately burden uh, vulnerable students, so low-income students and students of color, and students with disabilities, both diagnosed and undiagnosed. So when we were sitting down to do the fair use analysis, um, you know, the fundamental two questions in fair use are, there's a, it's a four-factor analysis, but it's really boiled down to two things, which is, is your use transformative? Are you using it for a new transformative purpose? And are you using um, the amount that is appropriate for that purpose. And if both of those two things are true, then you have a really strong fair use argument in these emergency uh, cases where you were actually that use was providing access. We saw these sort of questions around market harm about whether there was possibility that these things would be um, used in a way other than that original educational purpose. But it was really important, I think, to educate teachers and professors that it wasn't their job under fair use to guard against any possibility of other people using that. So for example, um, if a kindergarten teacher knew that when she was reading aloud and distributing that uh, video to her students, that most of them didn't have uh, accounts set up for an online teaching platform. So, you know, kids in, uh, secondary school might be already set up in the learning management system, might have a login, but very few early grade students did, right? Very few kindergarten, first and second grade students would. And so for many of those teachers, these fair use um, activities of reading a book to their students would be done on open platforms like a, a YouTube channel. It might be an unlisted channel, but it would need to happen in a way that those students didn't have to go through this really burdensome process of creating a access, like a login to an LMS or downloading an app when that might not be possible, especially for students who were using a parent's cell phone to view this or had only intermittent uh, internet access. So one of the things that was really important as we explored fair use and tried to explain how it enabled this was that you did not have to default to the most restrictive means. So as this work went forward over the summer, um, it sort of intersected with a, with a um, separate issue, which is that for many teachers after the um, immediate emergency in the spring, they started preparing for teaching over the summer and the fall. 
And what the teachers mostly found then was that the digital materials offered by publishers in both K through 12 and higher education um, didn't provide the flexibility for them to plan for an upcoming year where they did not know when and how they would be teaching in person versus online. So at the higher education level, most of the digital textbooks offered were offered for a rental option to students only. So libraries that had previously acted in the interest of their students to purchase print copies of expensive materials and make them available in course reserves and things like that were unable to. And in K through 12, many materials were um, available, but only in a single format. So you would have to decide, are we doing digital or are we doing print with the knowledge that for reasons of economics, disability, and learning style that those materials would not serve all students if you had to commit to either a print or a digital option. So because of that, we saw this real uptake on interest in open educational resources. And you know, for people in this room, um, an interest in OER can come from a sort of uh, longer term interest and commitment to the idea of like the equity around open educational resources or the value of open pedagogy but here we saw this interest in OER because the publishers just were not willing or able to offer materials that had the resilience that teachers needed. And so as teachers were switching to online teaching, this interest in OER led to a sort of renewal of questions about how fair use can enable the uh, creation of these flexible, resilient, and high quality teaching materials. And so um, because as we said earlier, the things that fair use enabled were not pandemic specific. So if, for example, a teacher is teaching uh, poetry and they want to include a short poem in a poetry text or OER, that is something that is enabled by fair use because it's a transformative use. You're taking it from its literary context to its teaching context and you're directly critiquing and examining the poem and you need to use, you know, in many situations, the whole thing, right? You can't argue that you should use a small percentage of a haiku. Every syllable has meaning. And so fair use would enable that. And it would enable it as much in a OER that was created and permanently used as it was in an emergency transition, uh, sort of emergency teaching model. So I think what really happened is the we had this emergency pandemic response where I think fair use really was flexible enough that you didn't have to sort of go through, you know, Teresa said earlier that, you know, basically for the quote, until they had a decision from the court, they had to assume something was prohibited. And I think with fair use, you have the opposite, right? If you have a strong legal analysis under the existing fair use framework, you can assume that you can go forward with that until you hear from the court. So it's, it gives you permission until you hear otherwise, instead of the opposite. And then I think um, going forward, this transition highlighted the failures of traditional teaching and learning materials to provide teachers and institutions the control and the flexibility and the resilience to meet the needs of all their students and to meet the demands of this hybrid online and then in-person teaching model. And so to support the development of high quality OER going forward, we sort of transitioned our work to, uh, to be a best practices in fair use for open educational resources. And so this is thinking through the use cases where um, fair use enables teachers to incorporate existing copyrighted third party content in OER. And I think that's important for um, a couple big reasons. One is if we don't uh, grapple with fair use, if we don't think through what it allows, then fundamentally certain topics are going to be off limits for OER, right? Like it's very hard to teach modern history, to teach art, to teach literature without the ability to engage in that subject matter. And then secondly, what I think when people do attempt to teach those subjects, they do it through linking out. And um, I think linking out is really a sort of um, deeply imperfect way to teach that for the obvious reasons. Ob there's link rot, right? Those links just don't last forever. 
but more importantly, linking out um, accepts that those materials will only be imperfectly available for students with disabilities, for students who don't have sort of high quality, consistent um, broadband access. And so really pushing people to rely on fair use rather than linking when that was available. And so going forward, uh, the best practices will be published uh, later this fall. And um, we hope that they will enable the creation of high quality, flexible and resilient teaching materials so that going forward, questions about, you know, do we want to deliver this material in person in the classroom or in online teaching? Is this going to be something that is in print for some students? So, you know, one of the things is in the transition to remote teaching, some students still needed print copies of materials. And then finally, uh, you know, questions about pedagogy. So many OER in the United States were designed to be teacher delivered, right? They were designed to be delivered by someone at the front of the classroom, talking to students and engaging them with materials. And one of the things we saw was a lot of those materials needed to be transitioned to being student led. So that they weren't being um, led in real time in synchronous education by the teachers. And so in all of those situations, Fair use can enable some refiguring of those materials in the emergency, but um, moving towards a OER universe can enable that flexibility to be a permanent part of teaching. Finally, in the higher education system, um, one of the most corrosive things that we're seeing in the United States is a shift in a model from purchase of textbooks to these short-term licensing deals where students either get a license for an individual textbook or get this um, sort of, I would say a slightly deceptively named inclusive access package where you pay sort of a flat rate, like a Netflix or a Hulu model for one semester worth of access. And I think particularly this year with uh, students ability to complete each semester being in jeopardy that those, those models don't serve the needs of students. But at the same time for OER, to successfully com compete in that market and to serve student needs, we have to really grapple with questions around fair use and understanding and using that to create those materials. Um, we're coming to the end. We might have some questions about this, but I would just um, mention very briefly, our project focuses on fair use to enable limitations, to enable the creation of OER in the United States. Um, our initial research in our, with our Canadian partners shows that even though the legal reasoning is different, fair dealing in Canada actually enables um, a very similar set of teaching and learning practices. And I think engaging with the international community here, it's important to sort of have a two-pronged approach. One is, I would say that every country has exceptions in their national law for quotation and for education, and that there are these core set of teaching practices that are enabled everywhere, right? The ability to take a quotation from something and say, what is the author saying here? Um, and that we should use those when they're available. The other is, I think that it is very important to reframe it, that if your national law does not enable these core teaching and learning activities, the creation of OER, the critique, and those things, that it is a failure of your national law. And that it is not a question where teachers should say, oh, we can't do these things. We should say your law is broken and you have to fix it to enable these practices. And by staying back and by the sort of open community not engaging with these limitations and exceptions, you miss the opportunity to make that case that law must enable these practices, not the other way around. So thank you very much and excited to talk about questions. Thank you very much, Meredith. So Here's the situation. I'm very happy we had this sort of time to let you speak in depth about the cases. I think it was needed because they show very well how these educational outcomes hinge sometimes on very detailed rules that need to be understood, that need to be addressed. Um, I really like, Meredith, by the way, you're framing the, uh, that there's a gap with publishers unable to offer materials that had the resilience that teachers needed. I think that's a great sort of statement because it also shows that just as we're having today an event on the open education sort of approach and the copyright reform approach, probably there's one more step to talk a lot more about um, 
uh, infrastructures, resources, not just public ones on which we'll, for instance, focus on, on market and so on. Uh, we have around 10 minutes left. Um, so this also shows I, I was expecting a bit more time, but I think the positive approach to this is we just might it might make sense to have another meeting. By the way, I see our conversation, it was preceded by a very good session at the Global Congress uh, that happened virtually from Colombia last month. There's the upcoming Open Education Global event uh, and so on. So this is, you know, not the last chance to discuss it, but nevertheless, seeing, you know, how much interest there is, we might consider I'm looking at Teresa mainly as part of our project, another event. But for now, uh, do you want to pick any questions uh, from the list and address them? All the three of you. Yeah. Actually, um, if you allow me, I think there was um, a very interesting dis discussion on the chat, and I already explained some of the legal parts of it. And I would like to focus on something that appeared throughout the chat. Um, that is this idea. Uh, people are confused. Why, why in online is this way and uh, in face-to-face -face is another way. And that's because, you know, there are different copyrights, uh, different rights, and therefore we need to look at them separately and need to see if they have exceptions to each of them separately. And that's super confusing indeed. And, and, and some people were questioning, you know, this is an odd framing. I think Paul Stacey said, this is an odd legal framing of education. And the, the question is, we don't have a framing of education. So we have a framing of copyright and education doesn't have a framing in terms of access. We don't have an access law for educational purposes, which is something that uh, for sure I believe that we need. We would really, if we had an access law for education, we could frame education uh, in terms of access and in terms of use. And instead of having to rely on um, lawmakers being able to draft laws that consider all types of educational uses and taking those uses from the scope of copyright protection uh, uh, through exceptions or to a narrow definition of the right itself. So I do believe that an access law would be very helpful, an access law that's separate and just deals with education. But that's not what we have. And, 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 and um, Although I think we could advocate for it right now, I think the best that we could do, and especially in Europe where we are right now reforming our own laws because we are obliged to it, is uh, to advocate for stronger copyright exceptions. And I had a question from Chile, what would be an ideal exception? Of course, an ideal exception is one that needs to be uh, as flexible as fair use. Let me say it, like an exception that is not, doesn't, that limits the use through its purposes. So if the purpose is for educational uh, activities, uh, then, then that's the only condition you need. You don't need to limit by technologies or venues or education providers or materials or extension of the materials. You just need something that is flexible and then work to understand what this flexibility means in practice, like Meredith says that uh, they have been doing. Um, now, we also need at an inter this is this at the local level. At an international level, we of course need uh, a supranational law that deals at least with cross-border uses. Okay, so I can solve my my national problems, uh, and if I have the institutional capacity uh, and the knowledge, and we know that some developing countries lack that capacity, but Alan will will also talk about that. So an international treat, all, treaty on exceptions would be great. Give a minimum standard, minimum rights for everyone across the globe, that would be great. But if we cannot have that, at least, at least we need an instrument, international instrument that will cover cross-border uses because a country alone cannot decide that its laws will apply uh, to the students and teachers that are located in another country. So we need a supranational instrument where everyone agrees, okay, let's apply the laws of whatever, of the country where the educational establishment is located or the country where the students is located. I don't know, create a rule, but we need a rule where everyone agrees that's the rule that applies to cross border and that I don't need to worry about 
uh, thousands or, or not thousands, but hundreds of potential exceptions applying to those uses because it's online, because people are located in different countries. Uh, finally, okay. one last. Teresa, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm done. I need I'm to done. pause you and a pause. quick comment from uh, Alan, Alan or Meredith yeah. before we finish. Okay. Uh, just one, one thing that came up here on the chat is that, sure, well, is that, well, if we have like a decision, if we have a sort of fair use, I don't like to call it fair use because it causes a lot of resistance. So we have a general clause of social function of copyright, which that's basically what the court said, uh, and that allows for more than we have in the law. Sure. Is that enough? No, it's not enough. It's not enough because, sure, I can do it. You know, I'm a copyright researcher, so I can do the reading of what would fall within the legal possibility and what would go beyond it. But teachers in general can't do it. You know, it's not it's not their job to say, oh, can I do this compared with the three-step test and plus the constitution? No, that's quite complicated. So sure, what the law, what basically the court is doing is like saying, well, we have more room to go in terms of education, in terms of freedom of expression and so on. And uh, you can go on. But at the same time, if we leave it for teachers, uh, they're going to still be lost or they still can do and what they can't do. So I do believe the best models are the ones that do list uh, a series of acts. There are legal, there are within the limitations and exceptions, and also gives more general cause with general directions of what other cases would be like, or what you should consider to have other situations where you don't have to pay for and so on. And at this point, consider we can't move ahead in the in the legislative process, because you know all different lobbies that we know, uh, we are doing that in institutional policies all around. And when the institutions do that, they specify a lot of acts that teachers and students and libraries can do. And at the same time, they create a sort of a safe harbor for teachers and students and the other workers within that uh, that space. And so far, that's what we can. That's more at hand. And I think we should take it, not only to create what would these exceptions look like when it comes to the federal law, but also to uh, move ahead with other policies like open education policies, uh, adaptation of material for people with disabilities, and so on. And that is what I think it's most promising uh, in Brazil and Latin America for the next year or, you know, for the near future. I'll be very brief. I know we're a little over time. Um, there's been a lot of discussions in the chat about wanting more specificity. So wanting more concrete language that clearly enables um, different educational practices. And I would caution against that. I think it's very, very hard to create specificity without um, putting things off limits. You know, you would never have drafted a copyright law, I think, 20 years ago that imagined both the digital teaching that's happening today, the pandemic, those issues. And I think that the flexibility is hard, but it is really, really, really powerful. And even within that, when we've tried to see, like in the US, there was a, a classroom guidelines document that was drafted years ago, and it was much more restrictive because it was a consensus process. So when you get something and you're like, we're gonna get teachers and we're gonna get publishers and we're gonna get you know copyright lawyers, you get something that is more conservative than the law, not enabling. Um, and then the final thing I would say is that figuring out fair use does not mean that you have to sit down at first principles each time and start from scratch. That you know certain cases, certain things are repeated. And so these you know, models of like prestige, critique, and illustration and using something as a learning resource, once you've learned how they work in your field, right? Like I'm using a newspaper article to teach this current events thing, or I'm using this foreign language article to teach this principle in language learning. You don't have to sit down from first principles and do the fair use analysis again. So I think we can build up this ability to recognize repeated cases and to treat them in the same way. Fair use isn't, um, hyper specific, but it is really very predictable. And so if you understand certain cases, that predictability is really powerful. Okay, thank you very much, Meredith. Uh, I really feel well, we wanted to schedule this tightly. At the same time, I wish 
we assign more time really feel we need simply another conversation to continue this. I would like to thank a lot, especially people who participated in the chat savagely for uh, presenting the Indian perspective. Uh, we need an event where we can talk about this. I think the uh, Delhi University case I always felt is very important and should be understood globally. Still, as I said, I hope we manage to share at least some of these perspectives and share them in depth with you. This is a uh, really an amazing uh, session with so many participants and I'm happy we had a chance to talk about copyright and education.